we would like to uh, ask uh, the presenters to present in alphabetical order. Another reminder to our audience to remain clear of the camera since the program is being live cast on YouTube. May I now please ask uh, our first panelist, Professor Fakrul Alam, who will be speaking on the sense of sound to please. Thank you very much. Uh, right. What will Shamsa think of next? <laughs> Teacher, scholar, critic, administrator, marketing genius, postmodernist. That's Shamsa for you. Wikipedia leaves the five senses thus taste, sight, touch, smell, and hearing, and six senses, of course, and they're all important, but it's sight that dominates the imagination. The world looks beautiful, as do young people, especially women, by the day as one grows older. Taste surely is next, and that must be why, with all, the, it, why with all its cities from here, Shatmarchit Road looks to be the most important road of the world. Touch is, of course, highly rated. After all, who can overlook the sensation of being touched by the special one? Smell is what gets you in Dhaka too. Good as well as bad ones, I hasten to add. And who can ignore beautiful fragrances anywhere, in flowers or people? I, for one, love colognes, perfumes, and aftershaves, and would like everyone who can afford it to never go without, out without your deliverance. But hearing always seems to be underrated. And the order in Wiki's list does no doubt reflects public opinion. But I must thank Shamshad for making me first here and letting me speak uh, first. No doubt in Dhaka streets or even in Dhaka homes, at times hearing will strike one as the most overpowering and bothersome sense. Starting with home sounds, let me focus on snoring. I'm told by the one who should really know that yours truly snores on and on in sleep. My dad did so while watching TV and said he didn't, and so once we snow, recorded his snoring. I have his genes and I guess Baba must be laughing at me from now, above now. But what is terrifying for me is the prospect of sharing a room with someone other than my spouse, who after all, can always take over hearing aid when with me to sleep soundly. On a couple of occasions I had to share a room with someone else, and one of them, and with one of them, I really suffered because I went to sleep late and the other person started snoring immediately. <laughs> On another occasion, I shared a room with someone who's here, and it's a wonderful experience. Both of us went to sleep immediately and nobody complained. So we decided that it must be our spouses making this up. <laughs> In Dhaka, as we all know, unwanted sounds will bother you a lot of the time. The call to prayer, for example, sounds beautiful on TV. When you switch on uh, and hear it uh, wafting out of the Grand, uh, Grand Central Mosque of Mecca. But what if you're unlucky enough to live next door to places where they use multiple mics all the time and the callers are all out of tune? And what if you're unlucky enough to be living close to where would-be leaders give loud and obnoxious speeches? I live in the ninth floor of a building opposite British Council and sometimes get disturbed by student leaders trying to impress everyone miles away by praising their leaders and parties or shouting slogans in the middle of night. I confess I can't stand any noise when I'm studying. My students, some of whom are here, will know I hate people talking in class. <laughs> Corridor noise in Dhaka is unbelievable at times. And I can't even start talking about noise in Dhaka streets, loud people and crazy honking drivers, enough to make one go mad when in our streets. So often you wish you had earplugs with you. And yes, sound can be so cacophonous Sometimes you want to pluck your ears permanently. But think of the beautiful sounds that we hear without which we couldn't survive. Think of sounds like the one Neil Diamond sings about in his wonderful song, What a Beautiful Noise, which you'll hear at the end of my presentation. Everyday sounds coming from the streets, street vendors, children playing in the streets, vehicles accelerating smoothly. Sounds can fill your ears reassuringly. And if you don't hear them, the world seems to end. I, for one, will miss Dhaka University's sound uh, you know, filling corridors forever. And think of music, the sound of music. The moment I heard Vivaldi's Four Seasons decades ago, I fell in love with Western classical music. And the moment I hear, I heard Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and the Ode to Join his last moment, I thought, delusively, no doubt, heaven was on earth. 
And I have to say, I can't imagine my day going well without hearing Rohini Shungi at one point or the other. For sure, hearing music is something I treasure and will never be able to slight. As the bard once put it, music is the food of love, and to me, one of the best ways to love life itself. Think now of the beautiful sound great writers create and celebrate. Recall the opening stanza of Lawrence's lovely poem about his mother playing the piano and singing softly in the dusk. A woman is singing to me, taking me down the vista of years till I see a child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tingling strings and pressing the small boy's feet of her mother who smiles as she sings. And think then of the tragic implications of not even hearing your mother sing when you read Shamsha Rahman's brilliant poem, Kokunawar Maki Gangai Shulini, which always reminds me of my mother I never heard her singing either. Reflect too on Milton's divine harmonies and think of the other blind giant of literature in English, Joyce, and his brilliant chapter on Daedalus, of Daedalus walking in the Proteus chapter of Ulysses. Stephen, and I'm quoting, closed his eyes to hear his boots crush, crackling, crack, and shells. You're walking through it howsoever. I am a stride at a time. A very short space of time, so very short times of space. Five, six, the Nakinanda. I hope I've got that right. Exactly. And that is the ineluctable modality of the audible. I could go on. This is a brilliant chapter of sound, but I have run out of time. Recall Keats's autumnal music, implosive field lines such as While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day. Or Dion of the equally spellbinding sibilant shash line in Bonundashen, Shishire Shabdra Matur Shundashe. Or Dylan Thomas's sonorous admonitions to us all in Do Not Go Gentle into the good night. The sound of music and the sounds of great poetry. How can anyone exclude hearing from your list of important things to appreciate when in English departments? But when we think of sound, we must also try to tune it to its binary, silence. For the two are forever locked in Saussurian opposition. One can't talk about sound without talking of silence. The sound of silence as the guy of Simon and Garfunkel song so beautifully phrases it, must therefore conclude my presentation. There might be people like Rashina around, Rashiano around who bark, silence is commendable in unique tongue tribe and a maid not vendable, but they have no place for those with sensitivity and preternatural apprehensions. Also, if you come across someone really talkative or a loud mouth like Rashiano, remember Pasiana's comment on his friend, Garciano speaks a great deal of nothing. And remember too that silence is proverbially golden. And know that we must all learn to hear silence as well as sounds. Think thus of Harold Pinter's use of silence in his plays, so menacing, so pregnant with meaning about human communication or lack of it. I, for one, am forever amazed by postmodern composers like John Cage and Steve Reich and the way they punctuate the music with silence. But I, my sixth sense is saying my time is up. And so I'll end with a classic quote from the bard, The Rest is Silence, and ask the organizers to play, play Neil Diamond's song to remind you of final time that we must value and learn to admire hearing, appreciate heard melodies, and even unheard ones in Dhaka or elsewhere. Thank you. Professor Golam Sarwar Chaudhary, who will be speaking on the mysterious sixth sense. Sorry, for being a sixth figure, I need to the allegations uh, the sixth sense, which uh, many would call a nonsense, others would call a sense beyond the sense. Uh, Stephen Hawking, one of the most powerful living scientists of our time. I'm quoting him, quote, there is no prescribed route to follow to arrive at a new idea. You have to take the initiative leap, unquote. Another quote from a philosopher, Immanuel Kant, quote, all human knowledge thus begins with intuition, 
proceeds thence to concept and ends with ideas. Unquote. So, they're speaking about these scientists, physical scientists, is speaking about something that we can't locate through the five senses, the five senses that display here, that go back to the times of Aristotle. Sixth sense, however, is extrasensory perception. And these days, neurologists are also speaking about five more additional senses. One is called the nociception, that relates to pain. The other is equilibrioception, that relates to balance. Then uh, proprioception and kinesthesia, relating to joint motion and acceleration. And uh, a sense relating to time. However, let me come back to my sixth sense. As I was thinking of these six senses, or the sixth sense actually, over the past three, four days, two things happened to me personally in my personal life. I was translating a story of the famous uh, Bengali novelist, late Bengali novelist, Humayun Ahmed. It's called Mittur Gandhu. And the story goes like this, that uh, a gentleman drops in to the doctor's office. The doctor is an ENT specialist. And the gentleman complains that he can smell an awkward smell. And the ENT specialist says, what kind of awkward smell? The patient says, I can smell death. So the EMT specialist says, well, nobody can sense death, actually. We can smell something that rots. But what about death? You are out of your mind. You need to go to a psychiatrist. You, go to, you need mental help. Then he confesses, the doctor is in a hurry. The doctor orders his assistant to return the money to the patient and says, you better come back later, have a cup of tea with me, we'll discuss about these things. But I think you are out of your senses and you need to go and see a mental doctor, a psychiatrist. Then the patient says, well doctor, believe me, I wouldn't have come had not my wife, who was having some problems, and before she left, I could smell, she was going to her father's house, and before she left, I could smell death. And no wonders, next day, I was told that she jumped off the roof and died. The doctor still didn't take it seriously. And as the doctor was kind of forcing himself out of his office, the patient smelled death in the doctor's body. But he didn't say anything. And that's how the story ends. Well, this is something that is ESP. But if we come back to mainstream literature, one of my favorite plays that I've taught for many, many years, I would love to teach it again sometime. I've taught it here to Hamlet. When Prince Hamlet comes back from Germany, from the university he was studying at, when he was told that his father was killed by his uncle, who had usurped the throne, and Gertrude, his, his mum, his mother, had hurriedly married his uncle. Within 40 days, he couldn't believe his senses. Then his father came as a ghost, and the ghost Hamlet, the senior Hamlet, told his son, that son, your mum, actually, I still love her, but your uncle killed him, so I'm giving you the responsibility of taking revenge against the usurper king, but not your mom, because I still love her. So Hamlet was in a dilemma. He didn't know what to do. He couldn't believe his senses again. 
So he staged the play within a play to make sure that for the veracity. So he saw when the potion was being poured into the usurper king's ear, he suddenly got up and left. So this he justified that yes, actually the usurper king is a usurper king and he had killed his father. And then there's a comment when he says there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Well, how could he smell the rot? Because his five senses were not sufficiently strong enough to convince him. And then he, he lost faith in everything. Like that wonderful, uh, not, not wonderful, that terrible harangue uh, that Gertrude faces from his son. And he says everything, he opens up. But then suddenly he sees that behind the curtain, there's some, somebody unsuspectingly goes in. He kills Polonius, of all the people, who was not responsible for anything. Again, he worked beyond his senses. I can go on quoting many of the texts, but I guess I'm running out of time. One more, I'll make it brief. This is, uh, I take it as a feminist play. I've written something from a feminist perspective. The 19th century uh, Norwegian playwright, Henry Gibson's uh, doll house or a doll's house. Why does Nora, she's happy, happily married, contented, satisfied. Why does she suddenly leave everything and go out out into nothingness because her senses, the five conventional senses, have failed. And she doesn't know, she doesn't believe in anything. She wants to become a new person as she goes out. I've, uh, well, I would not, I think, continue. Well, I can continue. I want to think. <laughs> Uh, Freud and uh, Jung. Finally, I was watching a few clips from the fifth, the, the film. Many of you might have seen The Sixth Sense, which was released a few years ago, and it was a kind of a hit film. But as I saw the film, I could not really discover any sixth sense there, although lots of Oedipus complex, elements of the Oedipus complex and elements of the Freudian theory of repression was there in the sixth sense. And uh, the last uh, point that I'll make and leave is very personal. Uh, a gentleman, a family friend, a relative, who is, was five years older to my father. My father died 30 years ago. A week ago, I was, I was having a sleepless night that I have occasionally. And after midnight, I suddenly started thinking about this gentleman, my father's friend. And I was thinking of him, thinking of him, thinking of incidents, events relating him to my father, to me, to the family. At seven in the morning, suddenly, I received a phone call from my brother in Chirigam saying, the gentleman is dead. Thank you. We'll be speaking on the sense of taste. Thank you. I'm surprised that um, there isn't a beeline for the washroom. This is turning out to be a very formal academic conference. That is not what we are supposed to be. We are supposed to talk about the senses. The senses will battle, not us. 
Ei. That should stop you from going to the washroom. <laughs> Sense of taste. How did we get these senses assigned? Lots of them. There's a kind of sixth sense behind the lottery. Chance. The world is ruled by chance. Anyway, but I'm happy to uh, be a champion of taste. The sense of senses. In fact, the sense of taste is only, some say, 20% taste. They say it's 80% smell. According to some, it's three-fifths smell, one-fifth sight, touch, and only one-fifth actual taste. So, should I sit down? Will you say that I don't have the right to speak? No. Because the senses are interrelated. They work in harmony. We have synesthesia. And when we realize that we will not, we'll become more liberal, open-minded, we will not be restricted in our vision. Baudelaire has a marvelous poem called titled Correspondences. I'd like to read out a few lines in Richard Howard's wonderful translation. The sounds, the scents, the colors correspond. There are odors succulent as young flesh, sweet as fruits and green as any grass, while others, rich, corrupt, and masterful, full, possess the power of such infinite things as incense, amber, benjamin, and musk, to praise the sense, senses, raptures, and the minds. In other words, when we don't think in terms of isolated senses, but the senses interacting, intermingling, we realize we become bigger. Our world expands, our minds expand. We transcend our limitations and uh, we become richer human beings. Now, so, um, where does taste come in here? Taste is the sense of senses. First, because, let me start at an abstract level. In the evolution of modernity, we have the emergence of new epistemic formations, political science, Machiavelli, this is what I'm talking about Western history. You have aesthetics. They happened at about the same time. Aesthetics began with taste. The theorists of taste were reacting against the rationalism fathered by Descartes. In, if you are a rationalist, you reason things out. If you say it is beautiful, you say, ah, it is beautiful because it satisfies these criteria of beauty. You see, the proportions are like this, etc., etc. But the theorists of taste pointed out that no, you see at a glance, you see at once that some, something or somebody is beautiful. It is your taste 
which tells you that that object is beautiful. And from this concept of taste came the modern discipline of aesthetics. And aesthetics, the importance of aesthetics in the modern world cannot be exaggerated. As Nietzsche said, it is only as aesthetic phenomenon that life can be justified. So we owe a lot to taste as this abstract concept. You, know, you can say, well, this is not the taste that we are experiencing now. No, but they're related. Because the taste that we experience in here with our taste buds in the mouth is also immediate. Just as you encounter when you see a beautiful painting and it's lovely, in the same way you taste something and you say it's delicious or disgusting, whatever. <coughs> so there are lots of studies nowadays. I'll not go into those. Like there's a book called Making Sense of Taste. Food and Philosophy by Carolyn Korsmeyer. I would advise you not to read it. <laughs> Instead, cultivate your taste. Now, what about the non-abstract, the absolutely physical, the brute reality of taste? Well, our development begins with taste. Look up a primer of psychoanalysis. See, the first stage of our development is the oral stage. <laughs> <laughs> then you move on to the anal sadistic and etc. And even the government of Bangladesh is very aware of it. I don't know if you receive emails from the government. I do. If you haven't received it, I'll gladly forward it to you. Matri Dukthopan Tek Shoi Kote Ashun Vodkobotta Vodkobotta Hoi First to 7th August 2017. Health Services Division. Okay. That's more reality for you. Okay? Now, so it is basic, and that is why it is the sense of sense. And it is not only the, uh, in Western uh, sort of uh, philosophy that you have this concept of taste. We got, you know, came out, uh, came out, came up with this centuries back. I mean, if you think of uh, East and West, I mean, we can claim to be ahead of them in many by many centuries. Uh, we say Machiavelli is the first political scientist. You see, and that inaugurates one aspect of modernity. Well, there was a continuous of Otto Shastro many centuries before that. You have uh, Western erotics, we have the Kama Sutra which goes back many centuries. You, they have the theory of taste. What about our aesthetics? It's all based on taste, the rasa, rosh. You know, let me just uh, read a bit from that. You know, in Rasa theory, you have the aim, <coughs> the, what happens when you experience art? The audience experience the relish, see, the asham, Russian asham. And through that, you experience the different palms, 
this tiny mouse. So we are familiar with the importance of taste in our culture. In our system of medicine, Ayurved, you have these, um, you know, dosha, vata, pitta, kapha. And good health depends on the balance of, between these. And balance, the balance has to be maintained by eating the right kind of food. So, if you, if you look up any work on Ayurved, uh, on the Ayurvedic system, it's all about taste. Eat this, a bit of that, you see, and the balance will be restored, you'll lead a happier life. And in literature, the sense of taste, I don't want to sort of go on too much. The, perhaps the greatest modernist novel is Proust's Alarisha's the Pesdu, In Search of Lost Time. He could write it because of the sense of taste. One day he ate a cake called the Madeleine in French. And it brought back this flood of memories of his childhood and he started writing. I was very curious about the Madeleine. Finally I found a jar of Madeleine in a sh shop in San Diego, California. And I said, I must have it. It's a very ordinary thing. But it's very extraordinary because of the associations. So taste is associated with memory. Um, so uh, the other senses. And without this, we cannot really be human. I'd like to end with just a bit uh, of poetry to underscore the importance of the sense of taste. They both, sort of, uh, in a sense, love poems about poems. I remember your nipples like vitamin E capsules, <laughs> promising rejuvenation. My tongue dreams your saliva. <laughs> and that's all. A short poem titled Drink to me only with thine eyes. This, this comes from Ben Johnson. That's the aperitif in love's feast. Lips for hors d'oeuvre. The entree is eaten with single chopstick. For dessert, pectoral goofies topped by sweet raisins. Then cheeses, your right armpits stilton. <laughs> the left, gorgonzola. And I slide down for a drop of liquor. <laughs> you see? Just one little clip, Casablanca, everybody's favorite love story. Can you remember at the end? He's, he's with uh, uh, Humphrey Bogart with Ber in uh, Ingmar Bergman and says, here's looking to you, when you saw, here's looking at you, Kerry. That's all you can do because she has to leave, they can't, you see, carry on. Here's, here's looking at you, kid. If they didn't have to part, he would have said, you look good enough to eat. <laughs> by saying, the olfactory 
God, beloved Bangladesh itself is a massive factory of smells. And I completely conquer with them. In any event, my life, my life will be done without the aroma of the freshly brewed coffee in the morning. The smell of my little daughter's hair. The smell, the kind of smell that brings back fond memories of my grandmother's kitchen. And of course, the smell of books. I admit I'm a book fetishist. I stick my nose, real close, to a book when I turn the pages. Then I could sniff the paper, that soft, powdery, a drowsy smell that comes off the page in little puffs, prompting me to say, I smell, therefore I am. <laughs> You enjoy eating food, I enjoy eating food, don't we? It will be totally dull without the sense of smell. If the sense of taste is the sense of all senses, then your sixth sense also says that this particular sense, the sense of taste, is parasitical on the sense of smell. <laughs> My three foremost passions in life, the B word, passion, the so three, for most passions, are actually three Bs. <laughs> Poetry, philosophy, and politics. And my approach to the sense of, sense of smell cannot but be poetic, political, and philosophical all at once. I can then surely advance my version of what might be called smellontology. I have made up this word actually. Ontology, by the way, is that branch of philosophy that studies being as such. It addresses the question, how do we come to be what we are? So, smell ontology. Also, the great German playwright poet, Peter Brecht, once said, I quote, where there is no stink, there is no human being. Unquote. Well, the great French poet, Right, Antona Artaud. In English, we pronounce his name as Arto, A R T A U T. So, Antona Artaud almost similarly asserted, I quote, where there is a stink of shit, there is a smell of pain. Unquote. By the way, forgive the S word here, it's not me, it's Artaud who is using it. Indeed, following Brett and Arto, one can advance a version of what I wish to call shit ontology. <laughs> I shit, therefore I am. But I ain't just talking shit, I hope. And by no means do I endorse the conventional hierarchy of senses which cite first, other senses later. In fact, my all-time favorite poet, the 19th century French poet, Charles Baudelaire, Kaiser has already mentioned him, exemplarily abolishes the hierarchy of senses in his fabulous sonnet called Correspondences, while, you know, to accentuating this experience, sensory experience called synesthesia. It's an intersensory experience in which one sense cannot be abstracted from another. One sense cannot be separated from another. Senses correspond to one another. I am totally with Baudelaire. Yet, I cannot but ascribe a certain centrality to the sense of smell, as Baudelaire himself does in his sonnet in some way, because in the sestet, he makes sense the reference point. One needs to notice this. Mark this then. The nose with which one smells is, certain, is centrally located on the human face of, without this nose is so indispensable for Professor Kaisaka, for Professor Sayyid Manzur Islam, for Professor Fakrul Alam and Kolam Sarwar Chaudhary and all these professors who are here wearing glasses. The nose without it, you cannot wear the glasses. The nose is centrally 
looking on your face. <laughs> your nose, your nose is the center of your face. Center here is spelled as S within bracket, S within parenthesis, C E N D E R. You send center and the center of your face. Of and begins with B, as I have rightly pointed out. So here, although Constant Classen et al. in the 1994 book called Aroma, the cultural history of smell rightly argued that unfortunately, for centuries, the sense of smell has been ignored or marginalized in philosophical, scientific, and social studies, if not always in literature. But it's none other than the German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, who, against Plato and Kant's notorious dismissals of the sense of smell, most radically re-evaluated re the sense, linking it to wisdom, mental presentation, and intuitive knowledge. Inaugurating, I argue, the first phase of what I wish to call olfactory modernism. In fact, particularly, if not exclusively, the novel throughout the 20th century has already exemplified a veritable olfactory term in literature. One can surely cite numerous examples, but owing to time constraints, I've been given only 10 to 12 minutes. I'll speak only of the trinity of my favorite novelists and their works, James Joyce's Ulysses, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, and Sermon Ruth's Midnight's Children, works that offer enormously engaging constellations of olfactory images and experiences without which all these three novels would surely be disastrous thematically and structurally. I cannot go into the details of all those olfactory images and experiences here, but I will try to make three points quickly and categorically. Number one, in Joyce, Garcia Marquez, and Rushdie, Smell energizes, enhances, revives the three M's, mood, memory, and motivation. Number two, and this is very crucial, very crucial, the praxis is praxis, the praxis of love making, which can surely be taken as the supreme charged poetry of synesthesia, will lose more than half of his life, minus the function of the sense of smell, it's not for nothing that Freud actually postulates the direct connection between olfaction and sexuality. And number three, there are fragrant smells and foul smells, both of which are subjective and social constructions and both are useful in their own ways. I should also point out here that some major feminist fiction writers in the late 20th century not only creatively remobilized the literary presentation of the, of the representation of the sense of smell, but also politicized and even radicalized it. One can readily mention the African-American fiction writer Tony Marshall's Sula and the Caribbean fiction writer Jamaica Kincaid's the autobiography of my mother. The two powerful novels that unsettle the bourgeois and patriarchal sense of cleanliness by celebrating the bodily, bodily orders of women. For instance, King Gates narrator asserts, I quote, I love the smell of the thin dirt behind my ears. The smell that comes from between my legs. The smell in the pit of my arm, the smell of my unwashed feet, unquote. <laughs> Indeed, as scientists have already shown, human beings are capable of detecting as many as 10,000 different smells, while the nose itself has 12 million olfactory receptor cells. Thus one can speak of smells that are clean, cool, crisp, cutting, and even costly. Then there are damp, dank, decaying, decomposing, dirty, distinctive smells that you can smell. For instance, in the novelistic world of James Joyce, while in Garcia Marquez, you have floral, tangy, tantalizing, mild, moist, musty, musty smells. 
then of course in the real world, there are all kinds of piquant, pleasant, polluted, potent, pungent, buttered, rancid, redolent, refreshing, and even exhilarating smells. But the entire range of smells available in two fundamental sites, I argue. All smells are available in these two fundamental, these two material sites, nature and the body. And they can surely instigate a whole new world of fascinating imagination, wonder, and fantasy. And the world of literature will be terribly impoverished by the absence of this sense of smell. And even bad smells can serve useful functions. Those of you who do pop cultural studies know, I hope, know by now, how some films, animation films, and other films already demonstrated the possibilities of using what have been called, not my words, not my terms, what have been called stink bombs and fart guns. Oh my God! I think they can be used effectively against tyrants, oppressors, killers, rapers, and so on. And also, James Joyce shows, although scatologically, how smell can indicate this intensity, the level of intimacy, and even can be epistemologically enabling. I can't help quoting James Joyce quickly here from his selected letters and beer with Joyce's scatological mood and moment, and I apologize on behalf of James Joyce if his words end up hurting your sense of linguistic hygiene. <laughs> So here is Joyce about his wife, Nora. I quote, are you ready? <laughs> All right, I think I would know Nora. Nora's heart anywhere in the world. I think I can pick hearts out in a room full of farting people. It is sudden and dry and dirty like what a old girl would let off in fun in school dormitory at night. I hope Nora will let off no end of her farts in my face so that I may know their smell also." Unquote. Well, well, let me move away from this catalogical and round off my talk with a prose poem of mine uh, written in response to two poems. It's a, it's a, it's a one minute long poem. Uh, written in response to two poems about smell I really admire. One is my all time favorite poet, Pablo Neruda's Ode, Ode to the Smell of Wood. And the other one is William Carlos Williams' poem called Smell. So let me read my prose poem, Miss in Bengali. Hey, Mohan, Jivanamondo, Apna Kovidai. Neil Shagore, Tiva Tiva, Fana, Rubuni Kram, even pretty Vichyaja, Dane Shonali Gango, even Lal Pere, Urono Sharitike, Udiasha Shoe, Dushor Gango, even Chile Dalai Legataka Rodela Gango, even Dukure Stop the Jolly Kram the Gango, even Kungure Motobeja Jala, Banglar, Nodi, Mar, Pakule Gango, Gande Borgondo, Dadir Heshel Tiki. Burbur Gure, Veshiasha, Shutkiri Gondo, even Dadu Jomin Tiki, Utiasha Patash Parikara, Patir Gondo, even Bikeler Marti, Podano Nagar Gonde Shundi, Milevisha Taka Podanus Simer Bichir Gondo, even Shikdari Hade Tokin Branta Tiki, Veshiasha, Hoi 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 Kara, Machir Gondo, Gondo Taki. Biscuit, biscuit, gram, or a mood take a very ash to the veja, chumur gondo, horrati, premicar, come a pavol, or a nun da gondo, magi purnimaita, chule, rom, botlano, teu carano gondo, 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 shishu muked to the lagondo, mahir naki, on the kal to the reja, shuntan and chule gondo. Cafete, momo, or a coffee gondo, no dun boyer pata. Chudia Taka Horo Pora, Medhavi Gondo, Mark Smoshoi, our banker, cashier Naki, Legataka Chop Chuke, our corporate Akar, Trupodi Gondo, 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 Taki Ato Jalil Hot Pata Horsha Gondo, Taki Dormuji Rock the Horror Toy Toy Gondo, Taki Mamadon of Hashani, 
সফেদ পাঞ্জাবি থেকে উঠে আসা আতরের মুলায়ম গন্ধ কবি হাফিজের গজলে গজলে শরাবের বেহুমুষ গন্ধ 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 গান্ধী পোকার এক ধুয়ে খাড় তারা গন্ধ তাকে মাটির সোদা গন্ধ শুয়রের বটকা গন্ধ পারদের ছাঁচাল গন্ধ পোড়া টায়ারের গন্ধ পোড়া মোবিলের গন্ধ মাতাল ভেতরের ঢেকুরের গন্ধ গাঁজার দমার দম গন্ধ 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 निर्जातीमेल to make sense of love liberation and life thank you thank you and now call forward our next panelist professor sayed manzurul islam who will be talking about the sense of sight after us for what forgiveness <laughs> he is told the show um as far as you said that uh, the nose is the center of the face remove the eyes and see how the face looks like <laughs> a block okay. now when the lottery was cast i was given the eyes and i expected to be a kind of informal conversation amongst us but i now see that everyone is damn prepared with notes and quotations and philosophers and fakrul um, is always very sound academically sound today was very sound with his preparation golam <laughs> sarwar because of his 6 plus flight <laughs> Always in very um, refined atmosphere, so he always catches the six senses as a whole, <laughs> and he was true to his um, uh, the, true to his vocation. Kaiser has a taste for the very refined <laughs> and the very prohibitive. <laughs> Look at the uh, wine glass. <laughs> I wonder. I mean, we do not have any of these objectionable things here. As far as the rose, which is fantastic, but I wonder why Kaiser is given that. But you have heard him, and so I am all for the taste that Kaiser likes to transmit to everyone. And uh, as far, of course, smells a good argument from 12,000 miles away. He can smell a rat. Or a rat shit, and a rose everywhere. Shamshad, I am so unhappy to see him coming after me, but that's alphabetical luck. And he feels through everything. He feels through Dhaka traffic. If anyone can feel through Dhaka traffic driving his car, cannot see anything, but feels through Dhaka traffic, he is a superman. And he's the one who thought this thing and gave me the eye. What can I say about the eye? Well, I grew up at a time when the visual was less electronic, more natural. I grew up in a town called Sylhet, a very conservative town where women were not allowed to go to the films alone. They had to be accompanied by a male, and the male could be from seven to seventy-seven. <laughs> so I belonged to that category of men when I was in school. So the apas and mashimas and khalas of the neighborhood got me as their uh, chaperone, and I went to the films. Yeah, well, not in the sense that I didn't have the sense. Okay, that's not. That's not. <laughs> Lucky because I got eight annas, eight annas at the time. That was more luck than spending time in the middle of these women. <laughs> They were all very senior, so I was a good boy. <laughs> and while the film was going on, 
mostly Uttam Shuchitra films. So my eyes are full of the images of his childhood. I, I, I see splendor, I see elegance everywhere. So that has saved me in a sense. But the intimate moments came. And uh, don't have your hopes high. The intimate moments were <laughs> Uttam sitting across the table, holding a hand of Shuchitra's hand and having a cup of tea. <laughs> that was the intimate moment. And my khalas and appas turned my face away. <laughs> I was not allowed, I was censored. <laughs> that scene was censored. And I grew up with a sense of what is watchable, lookable, gazeable, and what is not. And that is something I found as I studied lit literature. How much to see and what not to see. This is a very good balance. What I see now, is a surfeit of the screens. Remember, when I grew up, there's only one screen, the Metini show screen. And screens are everywhere. You have your iPad, your iPod, your mobile phone, a smartphone, everything has screens. And while we were having a fantastic conversation, I could see many of you Facebooking on your screen. You were lost in some other dimension. Imagine, without the eyes, what could you have done? Feel the braille, braille way or what? Anyway, so the visual is everywhere now, and one situationist, anarchist, Marxist, as far to be very happy with this, <laughs> Guy Debord, had written a book. <laughs> I, I know he's not anarchist, but he's mildly situationist, not normative. I'm also giving you some theory, without which, how can I justify my inclusion in a panel where everyone is giving theory? <laughs> And so he says, we are living in a society of the spectacle, where the image is the most important dominant in our culture. Imagine what has happened to those childhood innocence days in which the beautiful was beautiful, and now things can be photoshopped. <laughs> so your eyes are continuously deceived, and you are always facing a challenge, what to believe and what to not. That doubt translates into an existential crisis. How can you distinguish between what you see and what you do not see? So hyper-real, hyper-visual. That is the situation we are now. Even then, the eyes are important. Perhaps because the eyes serve the most important sense, which is vision. And screens everywhere, but what you have here is also visual agency. This time I am using in honor of Kushi Kabir. And see how eyes have translated and transmitted into many uh, into dimensions. For example, you have something called a gaze. And students of literature have to struggle with the female, uh, the male gaze. Mercifully now you have female gaze for people like Kushi Kabir who have developed this counter gaze. So what is a male gaze? It's something that destroys the pleasure of seeing. It imposes restrictions on what you can see, how you value what you see. The male gaze is terribly disturbing. And that is a pair of eyes that the male wears, which has gone through many transmutations. And now in our time, the male gaze is so strong I think women cower under this gaze. And that is not that's the reason why eyes transform into gazes. What about the other thing? The meanings which I the eyes convey. Last night I was expecting to write down something, but a friend of mine came and we got lost into the memories of childhood and we had no sense of time. So I woke up this morning, I, was, I didn't want to really write down whatever I wanted to feel like. But I remember while I was taking classes on visual imagery and what, the, the eyes also suggest omniscience and clairvoyance. Remember Shakespeare? He says, your eyes are windows to your soul. So this gaze inward is a very important thing. You have also your mind's eye. It's not the physical eye only. And I believe removing the mind's eye is more damaging than removing the physical eyes. 
I was teaching a course, I'm teaching a course in master's class here, I'm teaching Dr. Um, King Lear. I've also translated this play into Bangla and you have blindness figuring prominently in the play. So what is blindness when you lose your vision? So imagine how the transmission and transportation of the whole eye thing is going on. Eyes, if eyes tell you about meaning, what about meaninglessness? How many of you have read the fantastic novel, The Great Gatsby? The Great Gatsby, yeah. Remember this T.J. Ackerbar, the character whose eyes are painted on a billboard, be spectacled eyes, right? And he is looking down on the Valley of Ashes. Is it God looking down on the American wasteland? I'm sure God is looking down at the American wasteland now when Trump is in power. <laughs> and but at the end of the novel, we realize it could be meaningless gaze. So eyes can also become meaningless. Now imagine yourself in a situation which we are, we are all going through the in the, through in this country. The uh, section 57. A journalist um, jailed briefly for writing about a dead goat. Now, eyes are not the most important thing in this consideration is the eye of the mind which has been blinded. This is what happens in a situation where your eyes are blinded, your judgment is stunted, and you lose track of what you are doing. It's like King Lear moving through the storm in the heat and discovering that he had lost his vision long time before he set foot on the heat. And Shakespeare is all about eyes and eyelessness and how eyes can be regained. So thank you for listening to my theory. Now the last thing I want to see about the eyes is a book um, I recently read, I, I had a long time ago read, I recently reread the book, it's called Ways of Seeing. By John Barger. I would rather ask you to read this book because it's a wonderful book which tells you how many ways you can see, ways of seeing. One way of seeing, of course, I believe, is seeing the world through the eyes of childhood. I still value that childhood when I didn't have so many screens. In fact, as I said, I had only one screen. And I could see innocence in the eyes of people and beauty everywhere. What is happening to this world? You take a walk in Dhaka and you would end up being the saddest person here. Dhaka is a very challenging city. It challenges your senses, your taste, and it is a surfeit of sound. It destroys the fine balance in your ear. But at the end of the day, just get into a roof and look out into the night sky and you will see yourself reminiscing about your childhood sky which is never blighted. So that innocence is something that literature tells you. Once again, um, I'm finishing my uh, with, a, with, a, with a small, referring to as a poem that I once read in my childhood. It's about a blind girl who is being led to the uh, pond and she cannot see anything, she can only feel, she can only touch but then suddenly something happens in her because she is homebound girl as you in villages a blind girl is totally homebound suddenly she discovers something her mind's eye and she sees herself as the empowered person who can throw her eyes, gaze into the world and say I'm here that is the strength which I keep. Thank you very much. My new panelist, panelist is Professor Shamshad Murtaza, who will be speaking on the sense of touch. It was a pair of forceps that brought me into the world. The metallic tongs pulled me out of my mother's womb. I don't remember the touch, but every time my mother tells me how she almost died of eclampsia, 
I feel the touch of her shivering. I feel the touch of her pain. I feel how close death was, how near life is. Touch has memory, wrote John Kitts. Touches are memory, I learned. At school, they were vaccinating all the children. I asked my dad to save me from the touch of the syringe, and he wrote a letter to the principal, thanking for her, for the initiative. <laughs> I cried as I saw the needle turning hot red inside the candle frame, and then touching the skin of my forearm. I cursed my dad in pain. The medicine stung me as it ran through my veins, and the nurse rubbed my skin with a cotton ball. A blister appeared and was gone. A mark was left behind, a mark of my dad. A mark that affirms I'm protected against a certain disease, even after the pain is gone. I touch my forearm, and I'm touched by my dad. Touches are comforting. I learned. There used to be a bookstore at Hatkula Road. On our way back from school, my friends and I used to drop by to buy stamps that we could collect. I was probably eight or nine at the time. One day, the salesman asked me inside the store to look at some more stamps. He stood behind me and pressed himself against me. Touches are disturbing, I learned. Some touches carry bad memories from yesteryears. Since I can't touch yesterday, I might as well not be touched by it today. Memory of some, memory of some touches you know, needs to be deleted, I learned. Much later, while visiting my uncle in Berlin, I picked up his copy of the 1981 Nobel-winning author, Elias Kennedy's book, Powers and Crowds. The very first sentence reads, there is nothing that a man fears more than the touch of the unknown. It is only in a crowd that man can become free of this fear of being touched. As soon as man has surrendered himself to the crowd, he ceases to fear its touch. The man pressed against him is the same as himself. What did Kennedy mean? I wondered. Crowds grow as they touch each other and form a body out of fear? We have seen it in 1971. The touch of a cause, the touch of hope, can bring millions together. In the sad month of August, we recall how we were touched by a thundering voice that created a roaring crowd. Touches can hurt people together. Touches can give you hope, I learned. I guess an individual Kaiser Hawk would have been afraid of going to the war, leaving his pen and homes. But once he was touched by an idea, he became part of a crowd that did not fear the touch of the bullets the mortars or the shells. Some touches are golden, I learned. It's the finest touch, right? Touch that can turn everything into gold, but a golden touch can be very tricky. King Midas learned it the hard way by turning his own daughter into a statue. What can the story imply? I see the obscenely rich gentleman offering tribute to his daughter through a newspaper ad, a daughter who had slowly died due to the infectious touch of his filthy wealth. The mythical Midas touch revived. Touches are not so golden after all, I recalled. Anyone who has had a golden handshake will tell you how a simple touch can make one fall. Some touches are black and blue, I learned. Wasn't it Neruda who said, We the mortals touch the metals, the wind, the ocean shores, the stones, knowing they will go on, inert and burning. And I was discovering, naming all these things. It was my destiny to love and say goodbye. At the touch of love, everyone becomes a poet. Indeed, how can you love without touch? How can you say goodbye without touch? Remember Caroline Duffy warming her pearls? The maid in the poem makes sure that the pearls of her mistress are warm when they're put around her throat. Next to my own skin, her pearls, my mistress bids me wear them, warm them. The pearls hang onto the maid's neck like a collar of desire. And all day I think of her, she confesses. And when the socialite mistress goes to the party, the maid stays away, thinking of the tall men with whom her mistress was dancing. As she confesses, all night I feel the absence and I burn. The pain of not being touched, what glory is there in being a cold pastoral? John Kitts makes us reflect on the Grecian arm. 
the container of ashes, and think of the still unravished pride of quietness. The bold lover stopped from being kissed. While it is easy to glorify chastity of fair youth, the question remains, is it fair not being touched? Did the maid in Duffy's poem touch herself while burning in desire? Is that even allowed? How can it be a scene when one touches oneself? One is not an object. One is not an object in that glass house where the sign says, do not touch. I am my own master, and the master shall abate his burning desire. That is why Dr. Faustus made his pact with the devil to be his own master, a mortal becoming immortal, a moral becoming immoral. That too, through touch. Sweet Helen, make me mortal with kiss. Her lips suck forth my soul. See where it flies. Come, Helen, come. Give me my soul again. Here will I dwell, for heaven is in these lips. And all is dross. That is not Helena. Touches can produce fire, I learned. The first fire, we are told, came out of rubbing wood together. So did civilization. Touches can create civilization. Destroy it too. Look no farther than Helena. Was it touch or fate, a touch of fate? Was it our own doing, being touched by Paris? I guess that's what they call butterfly on a wheel in chaos theory, a simple touch deviating the course of, of a narrative. You may recollect how a gentle touch, a caress changed your life multifold, and you were never the person you should have been. In a poem called Touch, Mina Kartasami, the Dalit poem, a uh, Dalit poet from Chennai reminds. Dalit? Damn it, aren't they supposed to be untouchable? Why? Touch can make you unholy. Mulkraj Anand's novel, Untouchable, tells us the holy priest Pandit Kalinath can touch so many in order to make his manhood alive. Yet the same holy man cannot touch her brother Baka as it will endanger his Brahminhood. Bravo. What a sham. And how sad. Sham sad. See. Okay. <laughs> so, touch is ratio, I learned. This blind man walked into the carriage of a Piccadilly line in a train at King's Cross station. He had his hands stretched out, trying to find something to hold on to on a moving train. I reached out to help. Don't fucking touch me, he yelled at me, shaking my hand off. He wasn't blind after all. Maybe his heart was, not eyes. He silenced everything mobile and immobile on the train. Everyone was touched by his outbursts. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, he mumbled. It was too late. The damage had been done. The touch of a momentary outburst. I got up from the train at the next station, even though I had two more stations to go. Back in my uni, I washed my hands like Lady Macbeth. But the bitter touch refused to go. The touch of a white man on my brown skin felt like acid in the streets of London. Touch is cultural, I learned. My friend's professor came to Dhaka for a conference. He went back to the US and told his class how everyone in Dhaka was gay. <laughs> he saw guys holding hands, touching each other in public. So touches can be a big joke, I learned. Now the tacit roots of who touches whom, when, why, where, how, are complex and deeply ingrained social issues. A close analysis of touch can therefore yield much information about a society's most deeply held values. Do you touch the feet of the elders when you see them? Do you touch your own head to show respect to others? Do you hug to greet, like as a sir? Okay. Do you offer a fake kiss, you know, in the cheeks, one cheek, both cheeks? Now Margaret Andrew tells us, touch the first language, and it always tells the truth. Touch comes before sight, before speech. No wonder the Creator has given touch the, the largest organ, the skin. A skin that covers SMI's eyes, for Glenum Sir's noses, Kaiser Sir's tongue, only Sir Sir stands in a different height. Okay. Therefore, I'm here to cast my vote for touch. Because touch can touch you. Touch from a hand can soothe you. Touch from nature can soothe you. A finger touches one, but a rainbow touches many. And it is Shakespeare who said, one touch of nature makes the whole world king. Thank you.
now please invite the chief guest for our program today, Ms. Kushi Kabir, to the lectern to share a few words about her experience here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very encouraging to come here and see a hall full of people and many standing to and listening to an extremely interesting set of thoughts, provocative, uh, perceptive, in many ways uh, touches us in ways that are beyond the, just the senses, this physical sense of touch to another kind of touch that was also discussed. When I was first invited, it was Asfar who called me, I, uh, I was a bit bemused and uh, for a couple of reasons, but I said yes immediately, I love challenges. Anything that challenges me, I'll say yes. And the challenges were ones, one is that I was described as a writer. I don't know if I would call myself a writer, but uh, yes, then yesterday I was having a discussion with my daughter who doesn't stay here, but we have a likely conversations. And she said, when did you become a writer? And then her partner, her spouse said, yes, if you take all the things that she writes on her Facebook, all these different points, they're quite deep. So it could be, she could be a writer. And I said, no, I think some things I've written have been published. So I guess that could call me a writer. I write letters. I write, unfortunately, boring proposals and reports. But I also sometimes, when I'm very impassioned, write about some things that I feel very committed about. So I said, okay, so if they call me a writer, why not? I've been called many, described as many things. Yesterday night I met a young girl who studied in India and she didn't know who I was because I was in amidst a whole group of artists and young artists. So she said, what do you do? I said, that's a very good question. It's a question that I always ask myself <laughs> because I really don't know what I do. I know what I feel, so I know what I speak. So in the five senses and the six senses, what probably drives the five senses. I thought it would be interesting to come here and listen and then say a few words. It is called the battle of the senses. And in a battle, one assumes that one has to be a winner and there has to be losers. I don't believe in losers and winners. I think one only loses one when one gives up. If you never give up, you never lose. So the battle continues. So there's no winners as such. But the battles will continue and the battles has to, have to, it has to continue. But what was interesting also was here I am a female in a galaxy of male stars. <laughs> you knew I was going to say that. Predictable as ever. So, uh, so I was wondering, now I don't like to stereotype and generalize, so I don't think all males are patriarchal in their own minds just as I don't think all women are feminists in their own minds or do not carry patriarchal values. So I was pleasantly surprised that I did get a sense of all kinds in the five, six speakers that we had. And I was interested that I don't know whether it was certain comments that came in different posts on an all-male panel, the kind of people, do I want to go and listen to men only talk about sex? Or is it uh, uh, people asking, only men have this ability to talk about the senses? So I thought, okay, being the only female, uh, it would be interesting to see what's happening and then see what my position could be. I do claim myself to be a feminist, and I'm very really proud to claim myself as a feminist. And the reason I state this today, standing here, 
is because a lot of people are afraid of the word feminist. And I think there are a lot of men who are feminists, just as a lot of women are absolutely patriarchal in their whole structure and systems and their mindset. It was very interesting listening to everybody. I love the way, the play of the words, looking at, because everybody is a teacher of literature and English literature, of how they brought in different aspects, their perceptions of some of the things that I've read and I've had a different perception too, and their perceptions of how they brought this out. It's beautiful to listen to people who can string words together, which almost sounds like poetry, and Aswar did read out his most magnificent poem to us, which I think still, he seemed to have been the star before he even stood up, he started getting taps more than anybody. It's good to be a visiting professor. When you're a visiting professor, you don't see one every day, so then when you come for a short time, everybody's very excited. So, you know. Or, <laughs> so, um, yeah, but um, I feel that it is important that when we look at the census, one of the first things that came to my mind is I work with an NGO and often get invited to speak at different places. And one was people who are, uh, who face disabilities who have been bored with disabilities. So it was a very big, a huge, at the Bangabandhu International Convention Centre, main hall, totally filled with people from all over, <coughs> uh, NGOs and other institutions working with people with different forms of disabilities. So, you know, when we get up to speak, we speak a few words and we <coughs> say all the politically right things that need to be said. So we said, you know, in the NGO world, we should start opening up and invite getting people and recruiting people because one of the points that was raised was here were people with disabilities who've had the right education but never get the jobs because we assume that people with disabilities cannot ever do the work that people who supposedly have the abilities do. And I said, I think we should open up and do that. And I used my own example when I first started working and decided to be a field worker in the early 70s, immediately after a liberation war. Why should only the men be out in the villages doing the rebuilding? I mean, what's wrong with us? So they were saying that as you room and people won't accept you, you won't be able to ex accept the harsh conditions. No electricity, no toilets, no running water, no roads. And I know that, that the challenges I faced, which I had to prove that I was as good, if not better, than the others. So I said, okay, I think we should all open up. I brought in, uh, I said that, and then a few days later, a group of young people came who were visually challenged. And they said, when you said that, would you recruit us? And I said, okay, he said, they all said that when you just saying it for the sake of saying, or were you serious? So I said, okay, I'll take the challenge and recruit you as field workers, where they have to live in the village and go and work with the villagers and talk to them, and try and develop the villagers to have their own agency, to be able to <coughs> make their mark on, on in society and with their surroundings as citizens with equal rights as guaranteed in our constitution. So, will you be willing to do that? The only thing I will do is that people bike, we'll give the rickshaw for you to go because you, it's not physically possible. And they took the challenge. So I learned how to look at things from a different view of looking or sight is not always the physical sight. And one lesson is that when we have every year a monthly gathering of all the staff, because we don't believe in democracy, etc., and different modes, of getting everyone to talk together, the first night we show a film, a good film, so that everybody talks about it. So after the film was over, I said, okay, well, let's discuss what you thought about it. 
So then somebody who was visually impaired got up and I said, oh my God, I'm so insensitive. Here I'm showing a film to someone who gets up a lot. I said, you want to speak? That's very good. And I really apologize. I didn't think about it. And she looked at me and she, she looked at me in the sense that she talked to me and said, why are you apologizing? I don't see you. I don't see anything around me. I don't see the color of the grass, but I can feel it. And just as I see the world, and work in this world, and live in this world, and enjoy this world without my visual sight, I also see the film in the same way. So why should I be deprived of seeing the film? Because I cannot physically visually see it. That remained with me. And I realized sight is what you all have mentioned, is beyond just the, it's the gaze, it's how you look at what is around you. I think all of you have done such a wonderful presentation. It was supposed to be light, I'm being serious, but it was supposed to be light, but you brought in, every single one of you brought in a lot of serious thought. And I'm glad to know that this is being recorded so that all your uh, discussions can be used as lectures, not just for this university, but beyond too. Because I think that debate, I think one of the biggest problems we have in our country is a lack of space for debate and understanding and opening one's mind and learning to absorb as one wishes. Why do I love books? I love books because you can converse with the book yourself in the way you wish rather than being conversed to. And I am sure most of people who read books do the same. They just don't read the book. You converse with the book. And the book brings in all the five senses which leads to the sixth sense. And the sixth sense is uh, as you would, I think it's very uh, for us, it can be it can be as it was, as you want it to be. It's not something that's given. The sixth sense can be described as you yourself would like to describe your sixth sense. You may not agree and call it the sixth sense, but there is something within you that makes you go beyond the immediate and what is absolutely, you know, seems to be apparent. I mean, that's what reading does to us because the same book may be read by five people and understood and the points of the book are taken separately and that's when you can debate about books. And the same would be with smell, or with touch, with taste, I mean, uh, everything. I mean, I look at myself now, I never, my mother was a great cook, I never went into the kitchen. But now, I recall the taste of the food she made, and because I like food, I try and see what is this, what did she put into it, because now I can distinguish between the different ingredients. So I can tell the lady who helps me in the house with the cooking as to try this out in this way and that way. And some memory from somewhere of how she did it comes back. And it almost comes near, near to that, though I never went into the kitchen. So there is something about taste which is also bringing in other things. And I don't think one can look at one without the other. And it's not just the physical sound, positive, negative, the cacophony of Dhaka city. I think it's the noisiest city in the world. Uh, and there are a lot of noisy cities in the world. The, the taste and how taste differs, something that one likes, another doesn't like. It's just, you go to a restaurant with a group of people and you never know You've never ordered right, because some people may like exactly what you ordered, some people may hate what you've ordered. So it's, uh, the taste is, 
something that remains within you and something that you still, some things make a big mark on you, some don't. And I think it would be the same for everything that is possible. I, I feel that if some of the participants here, I think a few I would say would call themselves feminists, I hope so. Uh, there were stronger, really, feminists whose main ingrained feminism is within them. The talk would have been a little more interesting and diverse. I'm not saying that it wasn't interesting, it was, but the diversity would come in much more. And uh, whereas I wouldn't agree with everything that has been stated, and it's not correct for everyone. I think it's very important not to agree with everything that's stated. It's very important that we all start questioning and trying to understand, even if we agree, why do we agree with it? And if we don't agree, be very clear in understanding why we don't agree and where we don't agree. And I think that's very important. For me, Nora, and for all of us, Nora, when she walks out, it's not that she had a happy house, home, not a happy life. That last statement of walking out is the culmination of what a large number of women live. Apparently, nothing wrong, but yes, inside, and I don't know what, when it is not part of the five senses nor the sixth sense, but it is the feeling which is not the same as Dutch, of what one goes through, the mindset one goes through. Her walking out is the most important, I think, uh, for all of us, moment in defining agency. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much for inviting me and giving me the pleasure of spending this lovely morning talking with all of you.